Welcome back and in this video I want to look at SimSig and in particular the idea of head codes and timetables. So before we even think about looking at setting routes and getting trains through our system we need to know a little bit about how the UK rail network works. As you might imagine somebody sits in a room somewhere and decides on a timetable and a timetable really is a set of timing points that a certain service is going to meet. Now, in most cases, we would imagine that if a train was leaving Aston and travelling to Gravelly Hill, Erdington, etc., then it would be a fairly straightforward exercise because if it takes three minutes to get here, then the time that the train actually reaches Gravelly Hill will be three minutes after it leaves Aston, plus two minutes, two minutes, four minutes, whatever it might be. In reality, however, it's slightly more complicated than that, as you would probably expect, because you don't just have one train running by itself on an entire network. You have thousands of trains running every day in different directions, crossing each other and everything else. And so the timetabler's job is really how to make all of these services fit together so that people don't end up waiting in a train at a red signal for another train to get out of the way. Now, we probably all know that sometimes we do sit at a red, red signal waiting for a train to get out of the way, but that's not because the timetable is wrong. It only happens because a train has been delayed or there is some kind of fault on the line or the signals. And so the timetabler has to sit down and work out not only the times of the trains, in this case on the Litchfield line, but of course, what happens then when it meets a junction like this and we have trains coming in from Bescott to Birmingham New Street and in the opposite direction? How does this fit in with freight trains? There's so many passenger trains on this line. So how are the freight trains going to fit through? So there's lots and lots of variables that the timetabler has to decide. But what they end up with is a form of timetable. In this case, a very simple one that says 2N19, which we said was a head code. So a head code is really just a way of uniquely identifying a service. And now I say unique, but it's only unique for a cer certain signalling area. So there will only be one 2N19 on the Aston simulation or in real life and at the Aston uh, control centre. There will only be one 2N19 at Birmingham New Street, but maybe there is another 2N19 down in Plymouth or up in Scotland or somewhere else. But it's just a unique code that gives the signal a, a piece of a clue as to which direction this train is going in. Now, in the case of this simulation, it's quite straightforward because there is only one place for the up trains to go, and that is out to Aston. There's no junction here. There's no other place to go. So you'll notice that these all have a, an N number on to say that they're all going to New Street. So that's kind of quite straightforward. But when it actually comes to coming the other way, some trains stop at Four Oaks in Platform 3, some stop at Litchfield City, some stop at Litchfield Trent Valley, and some empty coaching stock trains go out at Derby. So you'll see here there's a 5D, and that 5D was a train that was going to Derby, and that's why it's got D for Derby, but the letters don't always match up. It is N for New Street, but it's U for Four Oaks, um, and sometimes the trains don't quite match up. But each of these then, if we click on it, has a timetable. This timetable would be what the, the guy in the office somewhere worked out that the, the platforms this train was going to meet, the times it was going to arrive and depart. And when you see these timetables, this one's fairly straightforward because the train stops at every stop. But if we look at something like 5D80, you'll notice here that there is nothing in this column. And that is because this train, because it was an empty coaching stock train, didn't stop anywhere. But it did have a timing mark just to give the signaler a clue as to what time this train was booked to meet these different stations on the way. And again, the reason this is important is in this case, once the trains leave here, they get to uh, Winkor Junction, which it meets another main line, which goes to Derby. And obviously, if this train is very early or very late, that can cause problems. So again, the timetabler has to try and plan all of these things so that all of these trains fit together 
without delaying anybody. Now, the reality is that doesn't happen. So the signaler's job is to try and regulate the trains so that the passengers are disrupted in the smallest way that is possible. So, for instance, imagine this train breaks down in platform three. Well, obviously, the signal is then or somebody is going to call a maintenance person to go and check out the train. So then what's supposed to happen here is you say, well, what's going to happen when 2N08 gets to Litchfield Trent Valley? It's, it can't get into that platform because the train here is blocking that platform. So what we're going to do or well, what we might do is we might cancel this route down here and we might bring this other train into platform two. Uh, Litchfield City and then turn that train backwards and make this train become 2N19 and possibly then this train by the time it gets here and goes back again is going to be able to meet these times so that by the time the train gets down here nobody even knows there's a problem and then maybe half an hour later the train here gets fixed and then we turn this 2N19 into 2N21 which is going to be the next service that leaves afterwards. So the signaler's job is to plan all of that. And the signal normally has to coordinate that with a control center. So each line has a control center and it's the control center's job to work out whether it's the right type of train, whether the driver has done the right number of hours and all those kinds of practical issues with it. But the signal has to work to try and make these trains meet the timetable as close as possible. So when you're doing that as a signaler, you have to know your area very well. You have to work out where you might be able to turn a train around, what you're going to do to minimize disruption for the passengers, whether to reverse trains, whether to change the platforms of the trains and all of those kinds of things. But what you've got to remember is that people expect trains to arrive at these stations and depart at a certain time. What they don't expect is for trains just to be cancelled. Um, and really, the better signaler that you are, the more trains that are going to run on time. So the timetables are there. I showed you in the last video that you can edit the timetable if you need to under timetable edit. We have the timetables is the tab that lists what you would think of as a timetable. So that's each service individually. But there's also various things in here. That's just a general list of, um, of what the timetable is about. You've got different types of trains which dictate, I'm not sure what that was, uh, which dictate the, the acceleration and the top speed and the length of the trains. The timetables use that information. And then you also sometimes have rules uh, about things like if you're sending an empty coaching stock train out, maybe that's the train that forms the return service. So you might have a rule that says if that train doesn't leave here, for whatever reason, then the other service won't come back. So you can set up rules as well. All of that's under there, but most of it's set up automatically. Every simulation comes with a default timetable. And then from that, uh, no, nope, didn't want to do that. From that timetable, we then get to understand what's going on here. And we can click on any of these, which will bring up the specific timetable for that train. So this one is going to Litchfield Trent Valley, platform three. That one's going to Litchfield Trent Valley platform three the next one probably will go into four oaks platform three instead of trent valley but as a signaler the more that you operate these simulations the more you'll understand where the trains go um, but other than that that's the basic gist of the timetable and the idea of head codes one last thing i want to mention is the number at the start of the head code is important the lower the number the more important the train so a class one train, if it has one and then, a, and then a letter and a number, that means it's an express train. And so that needs to have high, higher priority and the delays need to be minimized. Class two is a stopping service, although it's there's no clear cut distinction between a class one and a class two because some trains stop at some stations and not others. So it's not very obvious, but the timetable says which train is class one and class two. You have class three trains, which are generally kind of engineering trains. Class four is a fast freight train. Class five is empty coaching stock. Class six and seven are freight trains. Class eight and nine are very rare and slow engineering trains like track repair units and stuff. 
and then zero which is the lowest class of all is a light locomotive movement and in general the lower numbers go faster and the delays need to be minimized for those low numbers so class one has the highest priority and a class zero light locomotive has the lowest priority and just fits in wherever it can so if there are problems it's the freight trains particularly that can be delayed uh, without losing so many points but in general an express train or even a stopping train it's got people on it they want to get to where they're going they're the ones that you need to set as a higher priority so hopefully that's enough for now just to give you an idea of the idea of timetabling and head codes and then at the next in the next video we'll look at setting routes and the basic operation of the simulation any questions or comments please put them below